All right, we are back here on the Just End the Suffering podcast, the first weekend of March Mads in the Books, and boy, it was a lot of fun. Joining me today, the host of the Seeing Red podcast, our, my companion through March Madness year, Troy Moriel is here. Troy, how are you? I'm doing okay, Mike. It's uh, great to have the madness back. It was a fun first weekend plus Monday, and I'm excited to break it all down with you. Yeah, I, I'm very pumped about this one, and I mean... My bracket, I fill. I usually fill it out in the post every year. I got to find it in here, but it's what it is. <laughs> Useless. Yeah, All I got mine. Same, same here with mine. I won't rip it up, but, but same. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> it, it is completely gone. I mean, mine was done pretty much after the first two days of the tournament, which is a lot of fun. I mean, I'm not going to the pool, but, you know, I'm enjoying the basketball. Yeah, same here. Uh, you know, Texas and Ohio State crushed mine right away and you know it, i guess in a way it makes it more fun because then you can kind of just enjoy the games and not have to worry about your own bracket so you know uh looking on the bright side of things it could always be worse i guess yeah it could be worse it could be a fan of ohio state but we'll get to them in a minute i want to start off here i think there's been some change in the schedule this year because of the covid situation with college basketball i think one they need to keep going forward we need all four first four games the same day that was so much fun yeah, it was a, a great start to the tournament. You know, um, obviously, usually we do it with the Tuesday and the Wednesday, two games on each day. And the 16 seed games are never that entertaining, frankly. So you're really only getting the one game a night. Uh, Thursday night, you know, we get the really fun uh, Drake and Wichita State game going down to the wire. And then that goes right into the uh, amazing UCLA comeback versus Michigan State. It was really a nice, uh, you know, intro to March Madness, which was kind of fun, you know after the full two years almost without it. Uh, yeah, I like that a lot, having, having you know, basically wall-to-wall basketball from five to midnight as kind of a precursor for the uh, the main tournament. Yeah, because that doesn't really feel like the tournament the way they have it set up because you're watching one full game at a time. There's no flipping. There's no, okay, this game is boring. I'm going to go over here. You're stuck with potentially two 16s. And I know they love the national spotlight, but at the same time, I think you give two to Dayton, put two in another venue somewhere and have them, play them on Wednesday and then start bring them in on Friday and you're good to go, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I really think, you know, we, we've talked about really throughout this, uh, this pandemic has kind of started, you know, some new, um, I don't want to say traditions, but, you know, innovations, I guess you could say, you know, in sports. And I think maybe this is one of them where the NCAA says, you know, maybe it's smarter to do it this way rather than the way we had been doing it for the past, I don't know, decade or so. Yeah, indeed. Let's get to the actual tournament. And we, the story of the tournament so far has been Oral Roberts. The Golden Eagles knock off Ohio State day one. Then they come back. They beat Florida day two. Max Amos at Acemas has been a huge revelation. Kevin O'Banner, superstar team. And I got to say, they have been such a shock. And it's so fun to seeing them completely destroy the brackets across the country. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit I was, I was rooting a little bit against them in that first game because I, I had Ohio State going so far. Uh, but, you know, how can you not root for them, you know, in their in their second round game, at least, you know, you want to see the the Cinderella team make a, make a little bit of a run there. And, yeah, you know, they have the two stars who are really their uh, entire team, it feels like. And, you know, when you have, you know, two star level players like that in the NCAA tournament, you know, you never know how far you can go if those two guys kind of get hot. And, you know, the NCAA tournament, that's the beauty of it. You know, anyone can beat anyone. We've seen 16s beat ones, although it's only happened once. And we've seen 15 seeds uh, beat two seeds now. You know, it, like I said, that's really just the beauty of this tournament. Anyone can get hot. Anyone can catch anyone on, you know, any day or any night, really. If a team like Ohio State has an off day like they had on Friday, uh, they can get they can get picked off by, you know, a lowly 15 seed like Oral Roberts. So uh, really, really fun to see that. And and um, like I said, that's 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 the best part of the NCAA tournament is these, these Cinderella's coming out of nowhere. Yeah. Because the one, I forget who saw it says on Twitter, I mean, a great point because the NCAA tournament is different than all the other sports is basically, this is 67 game sevens. And all, all you have to do is be hot that one day to win the game. And this team did a good job. Takes up out of the league. I mean, they played Oklahoma out of the league. They lost Oklahoma state by five. They played Wichita state. They played Arkansas. They're getting the sweet 16. They led them by 10 at the half in Fayetteville end up losing that game. They also p- play well in another big non-conference game. This team is not afraid of the big dogs. That makes them a very live underdog next week. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think they were like the, f- the fourth place team in, in the Summit League, I believe, yep. going into the uh, the conference tournament. So, yeah, that's just the fun of it. And it's like you said, you know, it, this is not, you know, a, a series of games. You know, you're not playing a three-game series or a five-game series. 
you know, where the, the favorites would, you know, be, be favored in every game, really. Anyone could get anyone. Uh, you know, we, we've seen it throughout this tournament. Aldeline Christian as well. Um, you know, Oregon State making a run. You know, UCLA, obviously. So we've, we've seen, you know, throughout the years that, uh, you know, on any given day or night, anyone can kind of get off anyone. And, and uh, fun to see it with Oral Roberts, for sure. Yeah, and the scary thing with them, too, is that I think Ace is only a sophomore. O'Bainer is only a junior. So if they resist the urge, because I'm sure that the high major schools that come like, crawling down to Oral Roberts, down, down in, in Nebraska over there, Oklahoma, I believe it is, and say, hey, you know, why don't you play for us? If they resist their urge and stay in school, they could be a powerhouse next year. Yeah, and you also have to, you know, note the fact of their head coach as well. Um, you know, I believe the last 15 seed to make this run was Florida Gulf Coast, and then their coach – uh, went to USC uh, and got a, got a pretty big job at USC. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's the also thing is maybe these higher majors. I, I know a couple of the vacancies have been filled already, but you know, you never know if, if their coach could, uh, could, you know, move, move up the ladder as well going into next year. Yeah, that, that's them. The other big story out of the first round was the VCU situation where we did not get through all the games. They had to no contest against Oregon because they had three positive COVID cases, about 48 hours span. From what I've been reading, it sounds like they think this happened at the A-10 tournament where they were in a hotel in Dayton where there was like a high school tournament going on. A lot of people were wearing, wearing masks in the lobby. And unfortunate for them, but this is something the NCAA, I think this big warning shot them say, hey, you know, you got all these teams in the bubble. COVID's not going away. You got to be very careful here because still, these are the prime games of the tournament. You don't want to see anybody going no contest here. Yeah, and what frustrates me the most about that situation is it was almost, you know, entirely avoidable, I think you could say. You know, the NCAA had basically a full year to plan out what they wanted to do with this tournament to ensure that nothing like this would happen. And yet, you know, their plan was basically let's just kind of do everything as normal, not totally normal, obviously, but in terms of the scheduling, let's basically do everything as normal and just cross our fingers and hope that no team has to back out of this tournament. And obviously they, they got, I guess you could say, kind of lucky that only one team uh, had to had to back out really and that they only had to cancel one game but still at the end of the day there was just no real plan put in place which kind of bothers me and it stinks for a team like VCU who you know has made a run deep in this tournament who knows what they could have done this year um, I don't understand why the NCAA didn't push up the end of its regular season you know and, and make every conference end its regular season maybe a week early and then play the conference tournaments a week early and then do selection Sunday and then, you know, take a 10 day pause right there, you know, to, to really quarantine these teams to make sure that nothing like this would happen. I think that was, you know, just too obvious of an answer. I don't know why they went with it. I guess maybe the TV stuff, but still, you're still having selection Sunday and you're still, you know, having these conference tournaments, you're just doing them a week earlier. Um, I think that would have been fair. Obviously it would have been, you know, a longer layoff for some teams to, to, you know, take off for 10 days, let's say, but, you know, in the effort, in the, um, you know, hopes of having a full tournament, I think that would have been the smart thing to do instead to just kind of go in, like I said, and, and, and hope that no teams would get, you know, sick or no teams would have any issues. I, I don't like that that was their, their plan, quote unquote. So it's, it stinks for VCU for sure. And it's, it's a big uh, egg on the NCAA's face. Yeah. I also think part of the issue here too, is that I think the deadline for the replacing teams was definitely was way too early because six o'clock on Tuesday and there were still a lot of teams are still in the middle of their seven day, like run up to the tournament. I mean, you have these four teams on standby, like would it have been that hard to bring them to the bubble for like the the couple of days. And then like, if you get to the end of the end of the week and nobody's needed, you say, okay, sorry guys, here's like, and give the schools a little compensation for their time and say, and give these kids an experience to at least, you know, do something here as opposed to Louisville, who was the first team out like sitting at home. They obviously chose not to go to the IIT and then, I'm sure they're sitting there on Saturday when this news comes out, very frustrated that we could have been in this tournament. If they give us a little more time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, VCU, I believe played in the, in the, um, the very last game. Yeah. On, on <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. And then, like you said, I mean, 48 hours later there, okay, everything's clear. We're all good to go. Well, that's not, you know, how this virus works. We've kind of all figured that out over the last year. You know, you can't just do a do a test, you know, 48 hours later and say, all right, you know, we're good. Uh, let's let's play on with all 68 teams as normal. Um, yeah, it was just very short sighted in general by the NCAA. I, I don't understand why they couldn't have, have done more of a buffer in between the conference tournaments and the first round of the uh, of the NCAA tournament. It just it wasn't good planning at all by them. 
No, I mean, I, and as you know, I, I took some shots at the NCAA at the top of the show because the way they've handled some things over the past couple of weeks has not been good. This was probably le- relatively low on the scale of stupidity at the NCAA, but this one was not, go- not a good look for them. Yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, it's kind of par for the course with them. And it's a, it's a shame, like we said, that, that, that VCU has to kind of be the, uh, the team that's hurt the most by it. Yeah. Speaking of teams that were hurt by poor NCAA decisions, this one's on the basketball court, though. Loyola, Chicago, eight seed, as we talked about in the, in the bracket reaction show, top 10 team in the metrics and the net and the Ken Palm. NCAA selection committee says basically, you know what? You play in the Missouri Valley. You didn't really play anybody. You didn't beat anybody. You're an eight seed. They end up playing Illinois. They beat Illinois, knocked one of the highest teams in the country out of the tournament. And this is something I just don't get. And they never figure this out. The committee is that when you seed a team incorrectly, and they should have at least a, a line or two up on the on there. I guess they understand maybe you make it like a six or something because you're not sure about their metrics, but you're not only hurting them, you're hurting the team they play against. It was like got a much tougher draw in the second round they should have had. Yeah, that was, you know, like you said, really unfair to, to both teams to make that a uh, second round game. I think that could have really been, you know, a sweet 16 uh, type game with Loyola Chicago and Illinois where those two teams are at. And like you said, you know, if you look at the metrics, if you look at the net, if you look at the Ked Palm, Loyola Chicago is a, is a top 10 team in the country. So that's why, you know, I, I saw a lot of people saying this was, you know, a shocking upset or a stunning upset. I don't think so. You know, Loyola Chicago has been a top 25 team all year long just because their seed didn't really reflect that uh, doesn't make that some sort of a, of a shocking, you know, upset in the NCAA tournament, you know, like some other upsets that we've seen uh, even this, you know, this year alone. So yeah, you know, it's, it's a bummer for Illinois because they got a really tough draw. Um, I mean, you're always going to play a decent team in the second round, obviously, but to play a team like Loyola Chicago that I, I think is, you know, a perennial top 20 team, I guess you could say this season, um, you know, kind of a shame for them, but they obviously didn't get it done either. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of the bad job that like the committee did back when Wichita State was undefeated was the one seed, and then they got Kentucky as an eight yeah. and Kentucky's mm-hmm. metrics are so much better. They played a hard schedule and they were like, well, that's how we view it. And they basically stacked every top team in that region and try and take, basically give the Ramblers, the, har- the Shockers, the hardest path possible, and they did not make it. But Loyola Chicago gets through. I mean, this is not like a Colgate situation where they somehow gained the net with their schedule, but the metrics for Ken Bond said, they're not so good. They're a 14. This team should have been at least a five, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I agree. You know, a five or a six seed for sure. And like, like I mean, that that kind of speaks to, to what I said earlier. You know, that, that should have been, you know, a sweet 16 type game for Illinois to have to get through uh, definitely not a second round game for them. And um, I mean, I mean, you don't want to make too many excuses for Illinois. They got, they got beat pretty handily and um, you know, they didn't play their best game. They probably played their worst game of the season on uh, on Sunday, but, but still that, that game take came too early in the tournament for sure. Yeah. I also got to, uh, we have, we both have to eat some crow here on Syracuse. <laughs> Neither one of us thought this should be the tournament. Although I did say, would I be shocked if they won games? No. And here they are again, the sweet 16. They beat San Diego state, probably the worst game. The Aztecs had all season. Yeah. They, they beat West. They hang out against West Virginia, buddy Bayheim makes all the, makes another five threes in the game. They shoot very well from the outside. And once again, Syracuse now in that Midwest region which really is wide open right now. Syracuse has a, a game against Houston. I think if they can get that, they have a good shot to make them run the final four. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to explain um, with Syracuse, you know, it, they're, they're certainly not on the, the level of national relevance. I think you could say that they were, um, you know, in the, in the nineties and the mid two thousands and even the early 2010s, I think you could say uh, since joining the ACC, really, they haven't been on that level yet. You know, you look up and this is now three of the last five sweet 16s that they've been in um, all as a double digit seed. Obviously they just, they continue to make these runs, these kind of unexpected runs. I guess we should have seen it coming last week, you know, because it, it just feels like every single year this team is on the bubble. They're one of the last teams into the tournament. And then they make this type of run to the Sweet 16 or in 2016, obviously making that run to the Final Four. So, you know, I, I, I wish I could come up with some way to explain it. I, I think, you know, one thing that you can say about it is they play that zone. And the zone, you know – if you aren't defensively motivated, I guess you could say, or if you're not, you know, you know, hyped up defensively, um, it's not a very effective uh, defense, you know, and, and maybe it's a little bit easier to be motivated and to, you know, be playing your best defense 
uh, in a, in a, you know, a NCAA tournament first or second round game against San Diego state and Wichita state, than a game in the middle of January on a Tuesday night against Pitt. So, I mean, that's maybe the only thing that I could, could say with Syracuse, you know, I, I, I didn't watch every one of their games this year, but I, I watched enough of them that, you know, when you're, when you're more motivated on the defensive end, I think that has a lot to do with it uh, when you're more active and, and, but, you know, this just happens every year with them. It feels like where they're, they're a double digit seed into the sweet 16. Yeah. I think one other thing about that zone, it's also interesting. It's not even them at the bring up the intensity. It's just the fact that these teams don't see it because not a lot of teams play zone predominantly. A lot of them will do it occasionally, but not going to sit there in a two, three, the entire game. And if you're a team that plays them, if you like, you find out, let's say like, who was, you know, say San Diego State found out on some Sunday they were yeah. playing Syracuse on Friday and they had four days to get ready for it, which is not something easy to ask. Imagine what it's like for Bob Huggins, West Virginia. You have less than 48 hours to teach your guys how to combat a 2-3 zone. And they did a pretty good job. They just couldn't overcome it. The issue with Syracuse is usually that second weekend because then you have basically a full week to get ready. And you have this week, Kelvin Sampson has a week to help his guys run them through zone drills, tell them how to beat the zone, tell them where to put the guy in the high post, how to find that guy. This is the spot where if you're a Syracuse fan, you're like, if you get through this one, you feel like you have a good chance to get to the final four. Yeah, and that's that's a, a great point about that. You know, in that in that game against West Virginia, in the first, I don't know, 15 minutes or maybe even first half, I guess you could say, West Virginia really struggled to to figure that out. They did kind of, you know, figure it out by the second half, but it was just too late. That speaks to your point. You know, these teams, they don't know they not that they don't know how to play against them, but they just do it so rarely that it takes them a while to kind of get used to it, you know, especially playing a team on 48 hours notice like West Virginia did. It just takes them too long to, to, you know, get their rhythm offensively. And by then Syracuse is able to hold on to the lead that they built in that game against West Virginia. So that, that definitely speaks to your point about the, the preparation against the zone. Yeah. The analogy I'm, I'm going to come up with is it might be a bad analogy. Let's say like you're, you work in like a restaurant and you have the pastry chef and also you're asking him to like work the grill for you. He might struggle with it at first, but eventually he'll get it. It's like he needs more time figured out. Yeah, and um, you know, in that analogy, you know, by by then, you know, the the customers have already left, and, and they, you know, they've run they've run out of time. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's a good good analogy, though. You know, it it just takes them some time, but a lot of times when you're playing Syracuse in the tournament, it just, it just takes a little bit too long to to figure that out. Unfortunately yeah, that, for teams, it did. that Midwest region was a fascinating region because there was this pure chaos in there. Another thing that was a big surprise out of there. The Cade Cunningham experience was just a complete flop because he basically had minimal impact in both those games. Oklahoma State's gone. Oregon State's juiced him out of the gym in the second game. And I have to say, like, I know this is what K went back to regular season K, where K usually struggles the first half, makes bigger plays in the second half. He's not was not the same guy in the Big 12 term in the tournament where he was dominating from the jump. But mm-hmm. nothing it's Kate because Kate's gonna go to the NBA to be a superstar because he's got all the tools to do it there. But K in the NCAA tournament was a very was a very, very, very disappointing thing. Yeah, he just he didn't have it in, in uh, either one of their games that they played. You know, like you said, it won't impact his his NBA stock whatsoever. He's still almost certainly going to be the number one overall pick in um, whenever the NBA does their draft over the summer. So that you know that that's you know notwithstanding, but you know it's like we said earlier. You know, anyone can have an off day. Anyone can any team can have an off day. Anyone can have an on day. That's kind of the beauty, and you know, in some way, the other side of the coin with the NCAA tournament is that you know these star players we saw it with uh, Io Dasunmu as well on, on Illinois, you know, they can have an off day. They can play their worst game of the season and it's all over for them. We saw that with Cade Cunningham. He just happened to not have it in the, in the, you know, the one weekend basically that Oklahoma state was playing. And, you know, it's a shame that we don't get to see them playing further. And we don't get to see him playing further, but that's kind of, you know, what, you know, I guess what you could say about the NCAA tournament throughout its history is, you know, that there, there is no, seven game series, like you mentioned, it's, it's a one game, you know, one night, one day opportunity. And if you don't have it for those 40 minutes, unfortunately you're going to get bounced and uh, you're not going to look back fondly on your experience. No, they don't. And I do think it also segues nicely here because the story of the weekend, besides the underdogs, like your oral, besides oral Roberts and stuff like that, the pack 12 had a hell of a tournament. I mean, they went nine and one over their 10 games, Oregon got the no contest, but or their five teams at the Sweet 16, they're the most, they have a quarter of the Sweet 16 field, the most teams by far of any conference in the country. I don't think anybody outside of Bill Walton could have said that this was going to happen. Yeah, I saw a lot of people saying uh, this is, you know, Bill Walton's dream, or Bill Walton was uh, was right all along with the uh, with the Conference of Champions. 
it's kind of funny, you know, when we watch that first um, uh, first, first four game on Thursday night, UCLA over Michigan State. That kind of kind of set the tone for the entire weekend with the Pac-12 being great and the Big Ten, um, you know, kind of slipping up as we'll get to in a second, I'm sure. You know, but but with the Pac-12, um, I, I personally, I'm not gonna gonna act like I saw this coming, but I did think people were a little bit underrating the Pac-12. I think that they had some teams, you know, Oregon, um, uh, UC, UCLA, USC, even Colorado, who got bounced, I thought was a really strong team, and then Oregon State is just playing outstanding basketball right now they had some teams this year for sure and it's you know playing on the west coast not getting that exposure you know playing games at 11 o'clock at night no one's watching these teams um i, I will toot my own horn though you know I, I like we we talked about how terrible our brackets were uh throughout you know throughout the entire uh or throughout the start of the show my uh west region you know bottom half of the west region usc and oregon i had it so you know not many people had those two upsets but at least i had that one uh, with the two Pac-12 teams, so I, I will I will say I, I lost three of my four Final Four teams in the first weekend, but I did out of my entire tournament. That was the one thing that went well is that I had uh, USC and Oregon facing off in the Sweet 16. Good job, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you got you got that West region down there, the bottom half of it, and I will say. I had Oregon was very impressive the way they just dismantled Iowa. That game, I love the fact that they said, okay, Luca Garza, you can get your 36 points. We're going to shut the rest of your team down. The rest of the squad shot 26%, and that Oregon won by about 15 points. So that's a good good coach by Dane Alban, who's not getting enough respect in this country. He's a great coach. No, and I don't think Oregon as a whole is getting enough – I don't want to say respect, but, you know, they're just – they weren't getting enough notoriety. I guess you could say respect as a seven seed. I think that this team went, went fully healthy with their entire, you know, team in place, which they have right now. They're a top 15, top 20 team in the country. And I, I really believe that. Uh, I told you the other day, you know, I, I picked them to go to the final four. I don't know if they're going to beat Gonzaga. That was more of just a, you know, a guess there, but they are a, a, you know, obviously sweet 16. I think that they can be an elite eight level team. Um, you know, Chris Duarte is a star. I think that if he was playing on the East coast, he would be one of these, you know, household names in college basketball. And I think he's becoming one now to maybe the more casual fans, but they got a really talented team in Oregon. They got my guy, LJ Figueroa from St. John's. We're happy to see him doing well. He had a great game yesterday. They got uh, Richardson, Omaroy as well from Rutgers. They got a lot of talented players on that team. They're one of the most talented teams in the country when they have everyone healthy. Their problem was they just weren't healthy enough for this season, but still they were the best team in the Pac-12 in the regular season. And as I said before, I think the Pac-12 was a lot better than people thought that it was this season. And I think we're, we're obviously seeing that throughout the first weekend of the tournament with, with, uh, you know, a quarter of the sweet 16 field. Yeah. They also, the Oregon also had an issue where they had so many, like a really lengthy COVID pause in the middle of the season. They kind of will have some rough shape when they came back. They're peaking in the forum. Now, another thing I want to throw out here, USC's dominant performance. The thing I have to ask out coming out of the game is this, like what the hell was that out of Kansas? Yeah. Literally. This is the worst performance I've ever seen Kansas have in the NCAA tournament. They, they were not, they only got punched in the mouth by USC. Just never got off the mat in that game. It was so bad. This is the second tournament in a row this happened to them because remember 2019, Auburn ran them out, shot yeah. them out of the gym in the second in the round of 32 there. And that's something you're a Kansas fan. I know that was a bad matchup because they had the bigs, but they got torched on the outside. They have the lingering NCAA tournament, like invest, NCAA investigation hovering over them from the Adidas scandal. Bill Self, it might be in some hot water there. And mm -hmm. you got to wonder, like, is Kansas really on the way down here? Because I think that this is not a good look on them to just basically give up like, like 15 minutes into, turn, into a second round game. Yeah. And I, I think as you, as you said, you know, it's their worst. I think it is their worst NCAA tournament loss of all time last night. Um, funny story about that. You know, it was, that was a late night game. Obviously my friend uh, texts me with, uh, I want to say about 15 minutes to go. And he says, you know, at what point is it, is it safe for me to, to go to bed and, and, and shut this game off? And I go, well, if they're still up by, you know, by 15 at the nine minute mark, uh, I, I would think you're good. I think at the nine minute mark, it was up to like 25 points, almost 30. So yeah, I mean, Kansas just never responded. I think like you mentioned, we we're all kind of waiting for them to, to make at least something of a run. I know that Kansas wasn't, you know, as, as we usually expect with Kansas, but man, they just, they got punched in the mouth and just never really woke up in that game. Yeah, that was a really, really bad look. They lost by 34, which is, a, as you said, the worst loss in Kansas tournament history. I know Bill Self is not losing his job tomorrow, but at some point here, you got to get a little better results here because this is now, like I said, two tournaments in a row where they just laid an egg. 
Yeah, and they, they have that one uh, NCAA tournament or NCAA championship uh, from a couple of years ago or you know, over a decade ago. But outside of that, it's been a lot of disappointment for Kansas and a lot of earlier exits than you would want. They're just – I don't know what it is, but, you know, we talked about Syracuse always making those runs. It feels like Kansas is always uh, kind of getting knocked out maybe a little bit earlier than they would hope. I know I'll get the, I, I have Jayhawk fans who are angry when I say this, but no coach, in my opinion, college basketball does less with more than Bill Self. Yeah, that's that's a great point. They are they're always you know a top four seed, I guess, or a top five seed, I guess you would say. But they just never seem you know they they like I said they have the title. They did make I believe the championship during the uh, Anthony Davis uh, Kentucky year, but outside of that, they just they haven't you know been this consistent you know Final Four type team that I think they they have the talent to be like you mentioned every single year. Just just I base that more on the fact of like you see how many lottery picks come through Lauren yeah. and. They, all the talent that comes to that program, they have, I think, in self time, I think three Final Fours, one championship. That's not enough, in my opinion, the amount of talent he has. No, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with that. Yeah, let's go to the down teams here. And obviously, let's we'll start with the Big Ten, which got nine teams in. One is left, just Michigan. And they were given a big push by LSU last night in the in their 1-8 second-round matchup. Everybody else went out early. Illinois, we talked about the bad draw. Ohio State, Purdue didn't even make it out of the first round. Michigan State choked in the first four. Teams like Wisconsin, Maryland, they about, went about as far as they could given their draws. But this is a brutal showing out of the Big Ten. And this is a league that's been basically dying to get other champions. They haven't had one since 2000. Mm-hmm. This is a very bad year for the Big Ten tournament. Yeah. And, you know, I, we, we all heard the talk basically all, you know, all season since November you know, that this was the Big Ten's year. This was the, the greatest conference in the, the history of the, of the sport in the Big Ten. We, we saw bracketologists picking the Big Ten to get, you know, 11, 12, 13 teams in the tournament. Um, I think all of that kind of looks silly now in, in uh, you know, in retrospect with, with uh, how that conference performed in the first weekend. I, I, you know, I'm not going to say that the Big Ten was full of, of mediocre teams. I think, obviously, you know, Illinois, Ohio State were very good teams this year. They just happened to get picked off, but it, it's not – you know, when you lose eight of your nine teams in the first two rounds, that's not, you know, just a coincidence. That's a, that's a trend at that point um, with, with that conference. And, you know, I, I will say this, the lack of, of non-conference play had to play a role in that in, in somewhat that you're playing a majority of your games against conference teams. You know, maybe some of these teams, you know, picking off other teams uh, weren't as impressive as, as we thought. Um, but, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of par for the course with the big 10. Like you said, we, we've seen this, time in and time out with them, uh, you know, lo- like losing games early or getting teams knocked out early, obviously not having a champion, you know, since, since uh, in over 20 plus years now, it, you know, it's, I, 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 I would say I feel bad, but I really don't feel, feel bad for them because <laughs> of how much they got, they got hyped up during the season. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of funny, you know, as a Big East fan, I will say this, we got two teams in the sweet 16, the big 10 only got one. So uh, I'm happy about that as well. And, I will say this, you know, you can kind of almost say the same thing about the Big 12 as well. The Big 12 is kind of going under the radar oh, yeah. as another conference that really, really did not perform well in that first round. Had a lot of teams go out early, um, you know, obviously Texas, Oklahoma State, a lot of teams lost that should not have lost. Kansas, as we already talked about, one team in the uh, in the um, Sweet 16 as well. You know, that's that's a conference that the Big 10 is taking all the heat right now, but the Big 12 was was talked about on the same level as the big 10 really all season long. And now both of them have just, just one team left and it's their one seed. Um, you know, who would have thought at the, at the, the start of this tournament, if we were talking a week ago, if, if we would have done an over under on how many, how many big 12 and big uh, big 10 teams are in the sweet 16. I wonder what that number would have been set at. Cause it ends up being two. Yeah. I think we would have said probably around like seven and a half. Cause it would have said probably <laughs> half to get knocked out. They, they yeah. had one, the, both the one seeds made it. Every, two of the one seeds made it. everybody else did not. Yeah, it's 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 crazy to, to to think that, you know, and and I mean Baylor I think will make a run, but you know, Michigan is kind of the consensus like weakest of the uh of the one seeds and they got a tough, tough sweet sixteen game coming up. So we could not even see a Big Ten team in the uh in the Elite Eight, maybe. Yeah, that's a scary thought for Big Ten fans. And I think also it turns the Big Ten, other emblematic game that start flowing the radar here. Rutgers collapse against Houston. Like, oh my God, this team was up by eleven with four with five minutes to go. Get, got just basically tried to take the air out of the basketball the rest of the game and got scored 14 2 down the stretch and lose that game. That's a brutal finish for Steve Peichel. Yeah. And it's, and it makes it even worse. I mean, it would have been really cool to see Rutgers and Syracuse in the, uh, in the Sweet 16 as a local matchup. I, I don't particularly love either one of those uh, programs, 
but you know, it would have been really fun to see that. And if you're Rutgers, it, man, it's just a missed opportunity for you. And, you know, you look at that bracket right now, the Midwest, as we said, has, has just totally, totally opened up with uh, Loyola Chicago and, uh, and uh, Oregon state and then Syracuse, you know, man, if, if you, if you're Rutgers are, you're thinking, you know, we had a game against Syracuse who obviously is beatable. I'm not saying that, you know, they, they would have, they would have got right by Syracuse, but a game against Syracuse and then a game, you know, potentially against an eight seed or a 12 seed in the elite eight for a chance to go to the final four. I mean, just such a missed opportunity for them. As you mentioned that big lead and they just, they, they, they just got too conservative down the stretch there. It's a heartbreaking finish for them uh, for sure. It's, it was a good season for them, but man, it's like, like we said, that's just the perils of the NCAA tournament, you know, losing games like that down the stretch when, when you were in control, basically the entire way. Not only that, they had beaten Syracuse in the regular season race. They had already seen that zone. They knew how to beat it. So, like, mm-hmm. you could have had a yeah. – I think they would have gotten the Elite Eight if they got there. Yeah, and then, like we said, that Elite Eight matchup, you know, I mean, Illinois – or Loyola Chicago and then Oregon State maybe, you would have at least liked your chances in that as opposed to going up against a one seed or something like that. So, it's it's a real bummer for, for Rutgers and, and their fans. I mean, I, I think that that program is on the upswing for sure with Steve Peichel, but – um. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a missed opportunity for sure. And what was supposed to be a dream season for them. And it was a strong season for them for sure to get an NCAA tournament win for the first time in forever, but still uh, you feel like it could have been a little bit more for them. Yeah, indeed. Let's, let's do a quick, like a little quick rapid fire wrap up the first round here. Give me which team you think had the best week where I take the, the Cinderella's off the table. Here. Obviously they're for a thrill to still be here. So mm-hmm. aside of the team we thought might be here, who do you think had the best week? All right, are we are we gonna count? We're not gonna count UCLA as a Cinderella, correct? No, that, I, yeah, I think okay. more like the like the mid Cinderellas. Yeah, so let's. I'm gonna say UCLA then. I mean, I mean, you know, a team that 11 seed, um, you know, comes into to the first four down big against Michigan State. They rally against Michigan State. They beat Michigan State. They really just dominated BYU. I picked BYU to beat them. I thought BYU was kind of on that same level as the uh, the Pac-12 schools where. They weren't getting as much respect because they played on the uh, on the West Coast. I thought BYU was going to play a lot better in that game. UCLA really dominates, and then they get a good draw, I think, against Abilene Christian. I, I would have really liked to see UCLA against Texas, but um, they still take down Abilene Christian, and now making a Sweet 16 as an 11 seed and uh, playing, I believe, uh, Alabama in the uh, in the Sweet 16. I'm going to say UCLA. You know, it was kind of an unexpected route. I think also, if you want to stick in the Pac-12, uh, I don't know if you were going to say this, but in the Pac-12. Uh, Oregon State as well you know th- those those two teams kind of two unexpected Pac-12 runs to the uh, to the Sweet 16 as double digit seeds man Oregon State too they've just caught fire a team that shouldn't have even really been in the NCAA tournament and I think has won now I believe five consecutive like like do or die games uh, really incredible story for the, for them as well so if I'm if I'm picking a one and one a it's the two Pac-12 teams it's UCLA and it's Oregon State. Yeah, I'm going to go with Villanova as my team that had the best week here because everybody in America was saying they're going down. Winthrop's going to take them down. They've lost one game. They're not to say that Colin Gillespie. Jay Wright has them this week 16 again. They And yes, I get they caught a break. They're not having to with Purdue. They got North Texas, who's not nearly the same capable team. But there's te- still a lot of talent on that team. They're going to give Baylor a run for the money. I don't think they're going to win that game, but I think good job by Jay Wright getting them there. Yeah, and and we talked about this a little bit last week during the, uh, during the, the show that we did right after Selection Sunday. You know, people were writing off Villanova, I I think not really looking at the two games that they lost without Colin Gillespie. They lost on a tip-in at the buzzer against uh, Providence on the road, and then in the Big East tournament, lost to Georgetown on free throws in the final seconds. It's not like they got blown out and looked terrible in their two losses heading into the NCAA tournament. They just happened to lose two close games down the stretch. So this Villanova team, like you said, they got a really good draw, obviously not having to play um, Purdue and, and having the, you know, I, I mean, I thought Winthrop was a little bit better than they played in that game for sure, but they did get a good draw, but here they are still in the, uh, still in the sweet 16. Yeah, they are still here. Let's go the way. Who had the worst week? I and mean, I think there's a lot of candidates here. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would want to say like Ohio state just because, because of, you know, how disappointing that was. Um, yeah, I was actually, before we talk about Rutgers thinking about Rutgers as well, because of the opportunity that they have, but I, I guess I'll say Ohio state and their, their bad, bad loss to uh, or Roberts. I mean, like we, we talked about it before. It's the, it's the beauty of the tournament, but then the other side of the coin, it's a team like Ohio state that, you know, had aspirations to go to the final four. I picked them to go to the final four. And, um, you know, now they're, they're out in the, uh, in the round of 64, not even winning a game. So, 
I would have to say Ohio State just just you know losing to a team like Oral Roberts where if they played them a hundred times they'd probably beat them ninety five but they happened to to play one of the five that uh, went went the other way for them and uh, a team that had real championship aspirations that unfortunately falls well short of any of those. I think for me, number one with a bullet is Texas because Texas, what they did against Abilene Christian was a disaster because this team won the big 12. They won a bunch of big games all season long. They come into the tournament red hot. They lose to Abilene Christian who gets run out of the gym by UCLA the next game. So that makes that loss look even worse. And Shaka Smart comes into the year on the hot seat, gets himself off a little bit by his performance and win the Pac-12. Right back on it. They still have not won a game in the tournament since Shaka Smart took over there, and he's going to have to win a couple next year to keep that job. Yeah, and what, what kills you if you're, a, if you're a Texas fan is Abilene Christian didn't even play that well in that game. They shot like 30%, I think, from the field in that game. It was just a, it was a terrible game to watch. It was, it, was a, it was a disgusting game to watch. And to lose it on free throws at the end, and not even fouling a guy, fouling a guy going up basically on, on the, the, like a putback uh, to lose that game that way is just such such a, a letdown for Texas, another team that I thought was going to the Final Four. And, and another team that, again, if, you, if they played that game against Abilene Christian, and if Abilene Christian shoots 30%, I bet that Texas wins that game you know, 98 out of 100 times. Again, just happened to be one of the, the two that uh, Abilene Christian would have got through. So, yeah, a real bummer for Texas. And uh, Shaka Smart still looking for that first NCAA tournament win. Yeah, I'm also going to put Kansas right underneath them, too, because the no-show against against the USC after they got hit in the mouth, that's really bad. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, that's a uh, another one, a team that just, you know, another Big 12 team that just didn't really respond to uh, – we, we, we talked about it before, you know, a yeah. team that just didn't really respond. All right, let's get set up here. We'll do a quick little, like, swing around the Sweet 16 here. We'll go region by region here. West region, we have Gonzaga against Creighton and the USC-Oregon game fitting, un- like, typical luck for – the West, where they finally get three good basketball teams in the West region, it's in Indianapolis. None of the yeah. fans out there can see it. So now we get these three teams here. Is there anybody in here beats Gonzaga? I, I still think the the winner of the second game is they get them a run for their money. I don't. I still think they win the final four. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, as as John Rothstein says, you know, this is still the the Gonzaga Invitational, and they are the obviously the overwhelming favorite until someone actually knocks them off. I think Creighton can, can give them a game. I don't think Creighton will be able to, to hang with them. Um, but, it, you know, Creighton, we know they shoot the three ball exceptionally well. If they are on, if a guy like Marcus Zigorowski, Mitch Ballock are on, Creighton can give them a game. I just, I don't know if they'll hang with them. And then obviously I picked Oregon to beat them. So, I, you know, you've heard what I said about Oregon. I, I think that they're a top 15, top 20 team. So that'll be a fun one as well. As of right now, Gonzaga is still the overwhelming favorite. But they will be challenged, and I, I think both of these games. I think there will be a moment where you say, "All right, maybe you know, maybe they can get picked off here. Maybe they can get upset here." I, I don't know when it's going to come. It might happen in you know the first ten minutes of the game, and then they're on cruise control the last thirty. But I, I think in both of their you know in their Sweet Sixteen, and then assuming that they play in the Elite Eight, that game as well, there will be a moment where you say Gonzaga could lose this game. So who is your regional final? Then you have Gonzaga over who? Well, I have Gonzaga over Oregon. Um, like I said, I, I picked Oregon on my bracket just just to say, but I, I think it's gonna I I think it's gonna be Gonzaga over Oregon though. I agree with you there. Also, Creighton will be able to score with with Gonzaga. Won't be able to stop Gonzaga. That's gonna be their problem. Yeah, exactly. I just I just don't know. You know, I don't know if they'll be able to hang with Gonzaga on the defensive end. Yeah, South Region. We got Baylor, Villanova. That's probably one of the more underrated matchups this week. As you can see, if Jay Wright, that rest of that team still pretty talented. See, they can give Baylor a run for that money. And then the bottom there. We have Oral Roberts against Arkansas, the regular season rematch to see if they if the Golden Eagles can get revenge for blowing that 10 point lead in Fayetteville. I think this is still Baylor's to lose, in my opinion. I think what do you think? Yeah, I um I think Baylor will get through, you know, Villanova, kind of like the other matchup we just talked about. I don't know if if Villanova has, you know, enough on the offensive end really to 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 hang with with Baylor and their their three point shooting. Uh, they're just in, you know, I, I underrated Baylor big time going into this tournament. I thought that they were going to get picked off in the in the second round. Uh, actually, I didn't I, I did not think that they were going to go very far. They've, you know, proven me totally wrong. I, I think that they'll get by um, Villanova for sure. I think it's still their region to lose. But then on the bottom half of that region, you look if you're Arkansas, you know, you got to be, you know, counting your lucky stars that you're finally back in the sweet 16 and you've got a matchup against a 15 seed. I mean, I know that it's a 15 seed that's rolling, but you've got almost what a full week to prepare for that game against Oral Roberts, who you've played before, who you've beaten before. So, you know, you know who they are, you know, kind of how they play, man. I, it, the bracket just opened up beautifully for, uh, 
for Arkansas here. And I'm really looking forward. I, I really hope that we get a Baylor versus Arkansas um, elite eight game in, the, in this region. That's going to be my pick. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say Arkansas actually picks off Baylor. I've, I've been, you know, down, down on Baylor really all year, all year long. And um, I, I, I do like Arkansas in the way that they played after they got through Texas tech. So if I, if I was picking the, the bracket, I would actually say Arkansas over Baylor. I can see that too, because Baylor is just a team that like lives and dies by the three so much. They so much yeah. better that the shots are not falling as Arkansas. That's a problem. Definitely, yeah, and and I mean they were they were definitely falling against uh, uh, Wisconsin for them, and I, I think that they'll they'll get by Villanova regardless. But I, I think that'll be a really fun game if we get at Baylor and Arkansas. Yeah, I think let's go let's go down south, go to the Midwest region now, which is the which is the region of chaos right now because it's Houston and, th- and three lower seeds in there. You got Loyola, Chicago, Oregon State. And we have on the other side of it, Houston, Syracuse. I think in my opinion, I'm going to take the Ramblers out of this region. I think that this is a very deep team. Cameron Crutwig is a big presence in the middle, good defense. And I just can't trust Kelvin Sampson and his team in a big spot. I think they'll get by Syracuse. I think they're going to have trouble with the Ramblers. I'm going to take Loyola Chicago over Houston to get to the final four. Well, yeah, what's, what's I think the most fun about, about the Midwest region, and we kind of talked about how, how much it opened up um, before, I think you can make a legitimate case for, for every team in this region to make the final four. And, and, you know, I, I get, it's a sweet 16. You can really do that for every team now at this point, but you know, if you're looking at the West, Gonzaga is most likely going to win the West in the South Baylor is the clear favorite here. Like, I don't know if there is, maybe you disagree. I don't know if there's like a clear favorite in the Midwest. I think, you know, Houston, you can make a case for, as you said, Loyola Chicago certainly is, has a good shot. And we've seen Syracuse do this before as, as a double digit seed. So it wouldn't shock me if they did it as well. And, Oregon State is playing, you know, as good basketball as anyone. So I, I really think this is like the the one region that is just totally wide, wide open, you know, where you can really am I am I am I off saying that? Like no, no, could, I think you're right. Yeah, that you could really make a case for for any any of these four teams to make it. Um if I had to pick one, I mean it it's a total crapshoot. I would probably say Loyola against uh, I, I would still, I would still take Houston. I, I think I'm going to take Loyola against Houston. Then I'm going to take Houston to win this, uh, to win this region. I, I, I uh, but I think that'll be a very good game. And like I said, that game is a, is a total, total toss up. Uh, whatever game we see in the suites in the elite eight for that region will be a total toss up. All right. Last region to hit obviously is the East region. We got one, two and one, two and four in there. And then we have UCLA who, who managed to get through thanks to Texas, like, like laying an egg against the Abilene Christian here. So I think for me, the whole key to this reason is, I, if, is Isaiah Livers back from Michigan because if he's not, I don't think they're getting through. Yeah, yeah, that's really the, the, the key for that game. I think Florida State's going to give them a game regardless. But, you know, with, with Livers on the court, Michigan, I think, is, is up there with Gonzaga and Baylor as two of the best, as one of the best. I mean, they're a one seed, but, you know, really one of the best teams in the country and, you know, one of the favorites to win this tournament. But uh, I think Florida State's going to give them a game regardless. Uh, in the bottom half of that region, it's kind of like a, a football matchup, right? You know, UCLA yeah. and Alabama, uh, you would expect to see that in, in the uh, college football playoff, maybe if, if UCLA was a little bit better. But uh, that's a, that's going to be a fun game as well. I think UCLA and Alabama is going to be a, a real fun game. Can UCLA keep that momentum up? You know, they've already won three games in this tournament, trying to become, what, the second team ever to make the uh, – to go from the first four to the final four. They've, they've got to win two games to do that, obviously. Um, I think Alabama will get by them. And I, I, I could see, I, I think with the uncertainty with Michigan, I could see Florida State picking them off and getting a Florida State, Alabama Elite Eight. And from there, I would say, I think, I think Alabama could probably win that game. So I, if I'm picking, I, I would say Alabama. But this is another one where I think really all of the teams, or at least three of the teams, you can make a legitimate case for. It's, it's the bottom half of the bracket is a lot more open than the top, I would say. Yeah, I think the thing that's interesting about this resides livers is if we anybody can take the Rick Patino game plan against Alabama and execute it because Alabama was so frustrated because Iona in that first round game was basically take was going down the court, making them play half court, not letting Arkansas Alabama get out, shoot yeah. these threes in transition, get the easy layups. And they're like an NBA team where they want to go either to the rack or shoot from outside. And Iona was making them play full half court offense. It was frustrating them. And playing tremendous defense. Nick Cronin knows how to do that. He's done that his days mm-hmm. in Cincinnati. I don't know if he's the personnel to do it. I think if yeah. Florida State gets there, that's a very interesting situation because Larry Hamilton has the length. He has the athleticism there to keep up with that Arkansas team, Alabama team, because Iona had that issue where they had him beat for about 30 minutes. Yeah. They ran out of bodies. And Alabama's bench is the difference in that game. I think 
I'm going to take Florida State getting the Final Four in that region. Yeah, I mean, I really think you could make a case for 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 all of those teams as well. And it's like you mentioned, it, it's a couple of tough matchups for uh, for Alabama. A couple of teams that like to kind of play a little bit a little bit slower. And man, that, that Iona game was fun. They they had them there for for a little while, and uh, I think talent just kind of kind of took over in the end in the last ten minutes or so. Yeah, with that game was really just more the death of Alabama. And Iona would played very well, but just ran out of gas. That's something I can't blame them for because they've gone so long without practicing with all the COVID pauses. And like the guys had no legs left at the end of that game. And I mean, you saw that one sequence where Alabama hits the three, then Herb Jones with gets the steal and does, has the transition dunk to lead to the timeout. But they go so many one point Alabama lead to it's about a seven point Alabama lead. At that point, the game was very much over. Yeah, and if if you are an Iona fan, you really you know you can't be upset. You you played them really really tough for for a full game. You know a team that's way way has way more depth, like we said, and way more talent than you. So you really can't be upset if you're Iona. No, you cannot. And I think that's a good, it's a fun weekend. I'm a little concerned about the Sweet 16 round. I think there could be some very bad games in here because the matchups yeah. a lot of them are not very good. Yeah, <laughs> I think if we get the shot, I think. It's a fan you kind of want to root for the chalk to get through here because I think you have kind of a dynamic elite eight if the chalk gets through there. Otherwise, like, you could be in some trouble. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, you root for, I've always said this, you know, it, it's fun seeing a team like Oral Roberts, you know, win their first round game. And it's fun seeing Abilene Christian win their first round game. But then you look up and you've got Oral Roberts in Florida in, in the second round. And you've got Abilene Christian losing by 40 against UCLA in the second round. Um, you know, so it, sometimes it, it's more fun just to get the chalk and get the fun matchups. But like you said, I mean, there are still a lot of fun potential um, elite eight games if if the uh, if the teams that we expect to win do win. So it's going to be fun regardless. It's it's the NCAA tournament. You know, you're guaranteed madness. So uh, it, it, these games are going to be fun regardless if they're fun matchups or not. Yep, there we have it. And Troy Morial, thank you again for taking the time to do this. It'll be fun to chat with you next week after the Elite Eight round. We can preview the final four, your eighth national championship game. That will be exciting. Absolutely. And I can't wait to do that. It's always fun to, to uh, chat college basketball with you, Mike. Yeah, before I let you, I, I can you follow social media, keep on some of the stuff you're up to. Sure, yeah. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Troy Moriello. It's uh, M-A-U-R-I-E-L-L-O is that last name. Uh, I do the, If you're a St. John's fan, do the Seeing Red podcast. So you can check that out. Uh, we just did our uh, our season recap on um, on Monday, so definitely check that out if you get a chance. And um, yeah, thanks again for having me on, Mike.